Good morning, everyone. All right, this, this session will be a little bit more subdued than my previous one, so that's good. Um, welcome to our, uh, our first Happy Fire Let's Build session. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, the Happy Fire Java library and all of the aspects of that. Uh, I am going to cover how to get started uh, building a client application. I'm going to talk a little bit about servers as well. Uh, I'm going to point out that if anyone would like to try any of uh, any of the technology that we're playing with, there um, this session is geared towards working with your laptop open. We have got tables. There's a bunch of free space up at the front. There is power at these tables. So if you've got a laptop uh, and actually want to plug in uh, and not feel like you're uh, using up your precious electricity, uh, move yourself up to one of the tables up at the front. Uh, this is a really nice setup, actually, for that, which... I think is, uh, is kind of cool. Um, happy fire. One other thing I'm going to point out while I'm on uh, the fir first slide. To anyone who's been, uh, been using the library for a while, which if you have, you're probably in the wrong session because this is the beginner session. We've got a new logo, uh, which we did not have as of last year. The, uh, the little guy up in the corner of this slide, that's our raccoon mascot. Um, our previous logo, which we've had for the last 17 years on the Happy Project, was drawn in Microsoft Paint a long time ago by someone who was clearly not an artist. So I'm, I'm excited that we've got a little, uh, a little raccoon mascot. Um, we, I always get questions about why a raccoon. I'm from Toronto, Canada, which is the raccoon capital of the world, apparently. We have more raccoons per, pop, uh, pop, uh, per, per capita than anywhere. Ah, black squirrel. <laughs> Squirrels are cute, but raccoons are cuter. Um, they also tear into our garbage and make a big mess. There you go. Um, I am James. I have been, uh, been the lead for the Happy Project for 16 odd years, which is much of the life of the project. Uh, the project itself, as of three days ago, turned 18. Um, so Happy is an open source community around healthcare interoperability standards that has been doing its thing for 18 years now. Uh, I think constantly just how cool that is. There are very few open source projects in healthcare that have been around longer. Uh, the US Vista project, which is a great big open source EMR that uh, is used for now, still being used by the US Veterans Administration. They're, uh, they're probably the most prominent project that's older even than Happy, but there's not really many others in, uh, in this space. So that's kind of neat how long we've been around. Uh, the link that is up on the screen right now uh, is a link to the slides I'm about to show you. Feel free to, uh, to grab a photo of that and follow along. I will mention that all of the material I'm going to show you guys here uh, and any other presentation I ever do on, on the subject of Fire or Happy is Creative Commons licensed. Uh, all of the code I'm going to show you is open source. The presentation is free. I would be absolutely delighted for you guys to take this presentation and give it yourselves to your colleagues who couldn't be here. Uh, please feel 100% free to share all of this content. Uh, we are a big believer in free, open collaboration within the FIRE community. So, you know, I, I take this stuff to heart. I think uh, and I love the fact that we give so much of this content out. I think it's fun stuff. So, um, quick show of hands. How many of you guys have used Happy Fire before and uh, just want a refresher? Oh, lots of you. Okay, well... This is a real basic thing, so hopefully you will get something out of this. Uh, I'm sure you will. Don't, uh, don't let me shy away. But I'm going to start right at the beginning of how you guys can sort of uh, can take advantage of the Happy Fire library. Uh, I will say Happy is a Java-based program, uh, like a Java-based library for, for implementing Fire solutions. Um, so this tutorial does kind of assume that you know something about Java. Um, you don't technically need to. I'm going to share some links to starter projects uh, that you can get up and running without needing to program anything. So certainly, even if you don't know Java, I think you'll still get something out of this. But there you go. If you're a, uh, if you're a .NET programmer, you might want to stick around for the next session in this room, uh, which is going to be given by Miriam, who is over on the side. Uh, and we'll do almost the same talk, uh, except on the .NET library instead. So, a um, quick bit of background on the, uh, on the Happy Project. As I said before, we've been doing this stuff for uh, 18 years now. Uh, Happy originally started as an open source library for, for HL7's version 2 protocol. 
Um, B2 is, to this day, um, a, you know, go to a hospital almost anywhere in the world, chances are data is flowing around um, using this old HL7 V2 protocol. It's a clunky old protocol, but it's popular and it, it works. So we've been supporting a library for that for just years now. When Fire came along uh, in roughly 2011, we took one look at it and just fell in love with it and thought, let's do a, uh, let's do a sister project within, uh, within the happy umbrella that covers that. So for the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, I don't know, eight, something like that. We have been maintaining this happy fire library. Uh, the library is first off Apache, uh, it's, it's licensed under the ASL, the Apache software license version two, which is a highly business friendly license. I always like to sort of stress this. Um, if you guys are doing projects that are, you know, if you're building software that you're going to sell, uh, happy is a great choice for that. There are no restrictions, you know, there's no royalties, it's not a viral license or any of those things. We, we do believe very strongly in sort of, I don't know, empowering people to build their own products on top of the framework. So that's a big part of what we're up to. Um, the, the design of the library is, is sort of intended, uh, people, people, Java programmers tend to either love or hate things like the Spring framework, which are these vast expansive sets of modules that you can sort of put together in any way you want. We've been ourselves very heavily influenced by that. Um, Happy is kind of designed so that it's got a, all these little components and the whole idea is that if you want one but not the other, if you want all of them, you know, whatever your design is, awesome. It sort of is designed to be all sort of a bunch of Lego blocks you can put together. So what do those Lego blocks look like? Um, this is the overview I often give of all of the things that the Happy Library does. I'm gonna talk about a few of them here today. I'm going to skip a few of them as well. Um, do I have a pointer? I do. So we've got uh, a set of Java model classes and those things represent all of, the, all of the structures that exist within the FHIR standard. And in fact, all of the structures that exist across various versions of the FHIR standard. So, you know, FHIR's got a patient resource. Uh, Happy FHIR has a class that models the patient resource that you can use to build against, to get compile time checking that you've got the right fields and all of that stuff. Uh, we've got parser serializer libraries. So those can be used to take those Java classes and serialize over the wire into either XML or JSON. Um, there will be support for RDF at some point soon. Uh, there is a team actively working on adding support to, for, uh, to the RDF uh, encoding as well. So that's, uh, that's even coming along. We've got uh, a client framework, which I'm gonna talk about a bunch this morning. Uh, for adding support to talk to servers to your applications. Uh, there's an Android framework, so specifically a version of the client that works within Android applications. Uh, we've got servers, uh, including what we call the plane server and the JPA server, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference of those a bit later. And then we've got stuff like validation, narrative generation, uh, a testing overlay, a command line tool, and a bunch of other uh, bunch of other goodies. Uh, all the stuff in blue is beyond the scope of this morning, but all super useful stuff that, uh, I don't know, if anyone wants to talk, we will, uh, we can discuss that later. Um, there we go. So, first sort of subject in getting started with, with Happy Fire. We have got support within the library for today, um, all four versions that are sort of, we consider active versions of Fire. Uh, which is to say the second major release of Fire, which is DSTU2, uh, all the way through the current draft version of the, fire, of the spec, which is not even released yet, called R5. We did support the original uh, so-called DSTU1 up until about a year ago uh, when we released Happy Fire 3. Uh, at that point, we dropped support for DSTU1 just because we did a, sur a community survey and it didn't seem like anyone was still using it. Uh, I do always need to stress, we have no similar plans to drop support for DSTU2. Uh, DSTU1 went away pretty quickly. I don't think DSTU2 is gonna go away quickly at all. I suspect it'll be around for years to come because many, many people went to production. Um, so that, that one is not going away anytime soon. Within these structures jars, we've got versions of the data model that correspond to the different version of Fire. You will notice here, uh, each one of them lives in its own package. Uh, back in the DSTU2 days, we started our package names for the model with ca.uhn. Uh, there was a 
bunch of long history I'm not going to get into here uh, that in terms of reasoning, but we changed uh, as of our DS2.3 release uh, to this org.hl7 package structure, and we have stuck with that ever since. Uh, if anyone here, probably nobody is, but if anyone actually is working in production in DS2.2, I will point out it's a bit of a nightmare trying to migrate from 2 to 3, but it becomes much less of a big deal from then on. Uh, if you're building using the current release of Fire, which is R4, you're probably using those R4 structures. And the, the, the sort of the, the, the lift to get yourselves onto 5 once, once 5 is released will be relatively small in terms of the nuts and bolts of Happy Fire. Not to say it, it's, it's, it's trivial. Um, there are some significant changes to the standard itself between four and five, but at least the infrastructure is not a, a particularly huge deal, which is nice. Um, within the library, there are a set of classes that all implement this common interface called iBase resource. And you'll see iBase resource just littered throughout the framework. Uh, it's this thing that essentially, if, if, whether you're doing servers or parsers or clients, uh, anywhere you go, you're going to find this, this interface called iBase resource. Uh, it's the common ancestor of every single class, uh, every single resource class within the entire framework. Uh, so I've got an example here. Uh, the patient resource, of course, extends from a common class called resource, which is version specific. Uh, and then every version uh, goes up and has this nice common interceptor, of, or this nice common interface of iBase resource. Uh, we've also got classes that model all of Fire's data types. So, I mean, essentially, if you're new to Fire, uh, you may not have even encountered this yet, but the Fire specification defines a set of common data types. Uh, there's two types of these data types, the primitive data types and the composite data types. Uh, if this is news to you, what I mean by this, primitive data types are the thing that you probably think of as, as a data type in any programming language you've ever dealt with. Uh, this is things like your booleans, your decimal numbers, your coded values, um, your, your numbers, uh, I don't know, any of that type of thing. Um, Fire's defined a set of these, uh, these data types um, that kind of go through, and we've got classes that represent all of them. Uh, they're all named with the name of the type and then the word type at the end. So the string data type, for example, has a class in Fire called string type. The decimal data type in Fire has a class called decimal type, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, a logical question you may be thinking to yourself is why do these need to exist at all? Of course, the Java programming language has a native feature of a string, so why do we even have these data types? Um, it's probably worth talking about. Fire's got this funny concept inside itself that allows you to put extensions on primitive data types. I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent here. It's a weird feature, actually. Um, but the bottom line is we have these, these, these sort of these extensions, these wrappers around the native primitives in, in Fire, or in Java, rather, uh, that allow us to do fancy things like extensions. Uh, under the covers, these things are just using regular strings. So the decimal type is using a Java big decimal internally. The string type is using a string, of course, internally. The date type is using a date, so on and so forth. Uh, Fire also defines these things called composite data types. Uh, a composite data type, you can think about it as just a little tiny structure with a set of related fields that commonly get reused. Uh, a good example of that is there's lots of places in the specification where we use addresses. So, you know, you think about like a, a building has an address, a person has an address, uh, a practitioner has an address, and so we have this concept of address that gets reused uh, just all over the place in the spec. So we define a data type for address, uh, it's got fields like street and city and country and state, uh, postal code. I'm testing myself if I can remember all of its fields. Uh, and all of that is sort of encapsulated in this address data type within Fire. And then the Happy Fire library has a, a class called address, which represents that. So moving on to code. Uh, I'm going to point out a couple of things in, in this sample. First off, you'll notice in all of the code examples I'm about to show you, they've all got these funny class names. This one is example01 underscore create a patient. The reason they're named that way is the GitHub repository I showed you a link to at the start, and I'm going to put a link up at the end as well to that GitHub repository. Um, 
it contains all of the samples I'm going to show you here today. And these samples are all samples you can run yourselves. So if you want to come back and have a look at this example and try it, uh, all you need to do is search the GitHub repo for example 01 create a patient and you'll find this exact class. So that should help you follow along with all of this stuff. A few things to point out about the way that the data model works. Uh, first off, the resources are all named after the actual data model we're talking about. So the patient resource has a class called patient. If you want to create one, all you're doing is calling the constructor of patient. So there's really not much rocket science there at all. Uh, thing to point out, we're really sort of big on this, fun, this sort of the, the so-called fluent design of APIs. This is like a I don't know, in Java, in Java frameworks these days, it's a fairly sort of popular trend. Uh, and we've tried really hard to sort of set the library up so that sort of chains that you tend to do, like things that you tend to do together, you can, you can do as these nice little chains that sort of read really easily. So if you're adding a name to a patient, you can say patient.addname.setfamily.addgiven.addgiven.addgiven. Um, and sort of as one statement, you can construct an entire, an entire name that you stick on the patient. Identifiers work that way, uh, codes work that way. Really the entire API is sort of designed in this, we think, fairly readable form where you sort of chain things together. It's, it's a little bit sort of disconcerting when you first start playing with it because you sort of have to figure out what's the, like what does get chained and what doesn't get chained. Once you're used to it though, it, it does, like it, it becomes sort of second nature and becomes this really easy thing to program against. So I've always found that kind of nice. Uh, identifier here, of course, is that's at the bottom of the screen, but it's another nice example where you can sort of chain together, set my system, set my value, that is that. Um, littered throughout the spec are these, whoops, let's go back one. Uh, littered throughout the spec are these, these enums as well. You'll see them all over the place. Uh, Fire has this concept called required bindings, uh, which are effectively fields where you have to pick from a set of codes that are provided by the Fire spec. Uh, Java programmers will, of course, recognize that as a great use case for Java's enum construct. Uh, so we've taken advantage of that fairly extensively. If you're creating a patient, you, you probably want to set a gender on that patient as a simple example. And the gender, of course, has a Java enum that represents the four allowable gender uh, codes that are spelled out by the fire spec. Uh, things like contact point use, which is, you know, where is, what is this phone number for? Um, there's enums for that. Uh, and they're all over the spec. You'll see lots of these things. Uh, this does, people, this is one of these concepts. The reason I pointed out, it, it, people find it a little bit weird at first. Um, why do I have this enum? I find this limiting. In my own system, I've got five gender codes, whereas I only see four here. How do I add to that enum? Uh, the reason I point this out is that anywhere you see one of these enums, it's because it's a fire required binding. And the, the whole meaning of that uh, is just that for any of these fields, these are things that fire does not allow you to add your, add your own values. So you may have five gender codes in your own system. You're going to have to map that to one of the four that's provided by, uh, by the fire specification. Uh, in that case, and there's an entire, like that, it's, I'm, I'm glossing over what is actually a fairly difficult process, but the framework is at least helping you to, to sort of understand what's required in Fire. Um, you've still got the hard work of doing that mapping naturally. Uh, here's an example of the primitive data types in action. Um, I will point out mostly that all of these primitive data types are wrappers around sort of normal primitive concepts within, within the Java programming language. So if you're dealing with a field in Fire that's Boolean, uh, for example, patient.active, which is a flag, is this patient record active or not? That's a Boolean field. Under the covers, we're using a regular Boolean type uh, to, to sort of, to, to, I don't know, to, to represent that. Uh, and you within the Fire, within the Happy Fire Boolean type data type, can access that using, uh, using that native primitive of, of, of a true false Boolean, I guess, is the way to put that. Um, well, that's in a funny order. Oh well, there we go. Um, I think I dropped a slide by accident. I will sort of point out that as you deal with, uh, with resources, for the most part, if you don't want to, you don't even need to uh, sort of to work with these fire, with these wrapper types. Uh, right directly on the patient resource class, you can actually say set active and you can pass in a Java Boolean into that. You don't ever need to interact with the, the Boolean type, with the wrapper type, unless you need to. 
Uh, I always like to sort of highlight this because it is a gotcha as you're starting to use the library. People sort of get confused by these weird wrapper types that are duplicating functionality in, in the programming language to begin with. So you can, you can interact with the model without even needing them if you, if you want to. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the parser next. Um, and I'm gonna start there by talking about this thing called the happy fire context object. Uh, this is a class called fire context. You will see it throughout the library all over the place. Uh, and it's kind of the, it's, it's like the gateway to everything else happy fire. Whether you need a parser or a client or a server, uh, what you really need is a fire context object and everything derives out of it. That includes narrative generators, it includes validators, by the way, it includes fire paths. So there's all kinds of stuff that comes off of fire context. Uh, I always want to mention with fire context, the biggest anti-pattern in using the context object is creating a new one every time you need one. Uh, fire context is designed so that you can create one, use it for everything, uh, reuse it for everything, and not worry too much about it. They are an expensive object to create because it does a scan of the entire data model when it starts up, and that's why it's a bit of an anti-pattern to constantly recreate them. Fire context is fully thread safe. Uh, it's, it's safe to keep in memory. It's safe to put it in a static variable. Uh, it doesn't leak memory. It doesn't have threading issues. It has been tested like crazy because it was literally the first thing we wrote in the entire library. So don't worry about it too much. Just create one and reuse it as much as possible. Um, your performance will, uh, will thank you for doing that. Uh, a simple example of using the parser is shown here. Everything we do in Happy always starts by creating this fire context object. Uh, and then you ask the context for whatever you want. In this case, what I'm doing is I'm asking it for a JSON parser. Uh, the parser can be configured in all, sor in all sorts of ways. Uh, in my example here, I'm configuring it for pretty printing, which is that nice sort of indent indented syntax. And then I call dot encode resource to string on my parser, and it will spit out a nice serialized version of the content I showed. So what does that look like at my example? Because I've said pretty printing, I've got this nice formatted version of the resource that I'm showing you on the screen. Um, I'm gonna jump into the client now for a moment. I will point out that Happy Fire Framework has multiple ways of doing almost everything. Uh, it has just become this expansive framework over the years. Uh, there are two types of clients, uh, because there's two types of everything in this framework. Uh, there's this thing we call the annotation framework, uh, which uses, it's, it's a concept I think people will find fairly familiar if you've used other frameworks in, uh, in Java. Uh, it uses annotations to sort of declaratively state what your client is going to do. So you'll use an at create annotation to, to denote, to denote your, your create method, um, blah, blah, blah. This all, it's designed to look a little bit like JAX-RS uh, or any of those many sort of popular REST frameworks that are out there, but it's not that. It, it's its own framework uh, that's tailored to Happy Fire, uh, tailored to Fire, rather. Uh, I mention that only to say that I'm gonna show you guys the generic uh, version of the client, which is the version on the right on the screen. Uh, that's all of the examples I'm gonna give you here. The generic client is a little bit easier to get started with, uh, and it's, personally, it's my preference. I almost never use the annotation version of the client, although lots of people do. Uh, so this is a simple example of using the client. So in this example, I'm asking for a context object. Um, I'm setting a base URL, and the base URL that I've got up on the screen here, of course, is the base to our public testing server. Uh, I ask the context object for a client, so I just say new RESTful generic client. I pass it a base URL, and that's that. I've got a client object I can start interacting with right away. Uh, the client, once again, uses this fluent design of APIs where you chain methods together. Uh, and the way those things tend to work is you will use your client, uh, your client instance. You'll say either .create or .update or .read or .search. Uh, depending on what thing you're trying to do, and then you'll chain a bunch of things on top of that. And this, this is one of those spots where having an IDE with intelligent, you know, IntelliSense or autocomplete auto or whatever uh, your IDE calls it is really nice because you'll say dot and instantly you'll get a list of fire operations. You'll choose create and then you'll hit dot and it'll give you options where you pass in either a resource instance or a string depending on how you want to do your create. Uh, all of the client operations always end with .execute. That's the last sort of step in your chain. Uh, a common problem that people run into, and 
This, I think if we were to start from scratch, I, we might change this design because it's proven a little bit problematic over the years, but it is what it is. Uh, don't forget to add that dot execute at the end. If you just say dot create dot resource, nothing will happen. You say dot execute and then, uh, and then the thing sort of, it completes. Uh, you'll notice in the code sample I've got up on the screen that that, op that thing, that create operation returns what's called a method outcome object. Uh, the method outcome object has all of the details about what just happened, uh, including whatever response came back. One of the fun things in the fire spec is that you get all kinds of stuff back from a create, uh, a create operation. You might get an operation outcome resource, uh, you might get, um, you know, you might get, uh, you might get headers, you might get the complete text of the resource as it was saved. All of that stuff will be placed in this method outcome object um, for you to look at. And in my example here, I'm calling dot get ID so that I'm just printing out the ID that was assigned by the server for my create. I think I'm already running out of time, so I'm gonna try and go a little bit faster. Uh, there are, of course, you know, all kinds of other things that will come out from that method outcome. Searching, I've got one big complicated example here of how to do a search. Don't worry about uh, all of the specifics of what I'm doing here. Really what I wanna highlight is a bunch of the features of Fire's searching capability is all here. It's kinda nice, you get some compile time checking. In this example, I'm searching for patients with a name and a birth date. I'm asking the server to give me 100 back and give me a bundle instance as the, the Java response to all of that. Uh, and then when I execute that, I, uh, I get a bunch of details back. Um, I realize, I mean, this is a great big blob of text and a lot of the way the client works, I mean, when you're first starting with it, it you, you know, you might, you'd be forgiven for wondering, like, how do I do the specific thing I'm up to? I will point out there are examples of everything uh, up on the, uh, the link I've got here. So there are just tons and tons of code samples on the Happy Fire website that go through how would I do like a version aware update or a conditional create or whatever crazy feature of Fire you're trying to do. Uh, there are things in the client that cover all of those. So do spend some time with the, uh, with the documentation that's here. It is, I don't know, I like to think it's pretty extensive actually. I'm gonna talk quickly about servers um, and then I'm gonna leave us with a, uh, with a set of slides that give an example that you can use to actually start playing with some of this code yourself. Uh, the Fire Server module has three flavors in fact. Um, and it's worth spending a bit of time talking about the difference. The first one is what we call the plain server. Uh, the plain server in Happy Fire is, uh, it, it's for doing what's often called a fire facade. And in fact, if you're using the .NET Vonk server, uh, the plain server is, is exactly equivalent to the Vonk facade, except in Java, instead of C Sharp, of course. Um, the idea here is you've got your own storage engine, your own data model that's underneath. It already exists probably, and you want to put a fire server on top of it. Uh, example use cases here would include our first one when we wrote this server. Uh, at the time that we created Happy Fire, uh, I was working for a hospital network in Toronto, and we had, of course, a bunch of systems that had been around for years. We had an enterprise scheduling system and a, lab, a bunch of lab systems, an EMR, all kinds of other things, and we thought this would be great to put a common fire API on top of our existing databases. That was use case number one for us as we adopted fire uh, at UHN where I was working. And we wrote Happy Fire to support that specifically, so if you've got that sort of situation, you've got an application you've already written, you want to put fire on top of it, the plain server is the thing for you. I've seen implementations that go against great big vendor products that go against proprietary research databases. I've seen implementations that serve up data from CSV files that are stored for research analytics. Uh, I've seen instances that go against MongoDB, against Hadoop, against Cassandra. So people have written all kinds of crazy implementations of servers against backends using the plain server, and I will spend some time talking about that here. The second module for the server, and I would say most usage out there is one of these two things, and they're pretty much 50-50, uh, is the JPA server. Um, Happy's JPA server is kind of a fire server in a box. It takes advantage of a library called Hibernate, which is another one of those Java technologies that's just love it or hate it. Some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, I get it if you don't like it, but you don't need to interact directly with Hibernate, even if you're using this framework. Uh, the JPA server provides its own set of database tables. You connect it to an instance of Postgres or uh, 
or Oracle or SQL Server or Derby or any of the sort of Hibernate supported persistence layers. Uh, and it's sort of, it'll stick a server on top of that. It goes and it creates all the tables it needs. It's a very comprehensive implementation of the fire spec. Uh, it goes into all of the basic sort of read, write, create, search operations, handles transactions, have, handles subscriptions, handles terminology operations. So whatever corner case of the fire spec you've got, it's probably implemented in JPA. Uh, I'm not going to talk about JPA here, but I do have a link to a starter project. So if you're interested in that, I will show a link at the end to that. Uh, we've also got support for the JAXRS. Um, whoops, I didn't mean to move. There we go. We've also got support for JAXRS. Uh, I will say the JAXRS part of the, the, the framework is less complete than the, uh, the non-JAXRS version. So unless you've got existing JAXRS deployments, uh, that you want to just layer happy into, I would recommend not going that route. Although if you've got, you're already using JAXRS, no reason not to, uh, to continue that with happy as well. So uh, the sort of anatomy of a happy fire plane server is this. Uh, we are built on top of the standard JEE servlet technology. So uh, the idea of course in Java is they defined a spec called servlet. You write a compatible sort of server that implements that spec. And then you can deploy that to any of a whole host of different, uh, of different sort of application servers. Tomcat by far is the most popular one. Um, Glassfish is another great example. There's WebSphere and JBoss. There's all these nice application servers. Uh, I don't list it here and I don't know why. Uh, Jetty, which is my personal preference. Our public test server is hosted on a server called Jetty and I would recommend using it if uh, you don't already have a preference. Uh, and there we go. How the thing works is you write these things called resource providers. Uh, resource providers are little sort of POJO classes uh, that implement whatever bits of the fire spec you want to implement. So you're gonna write code for your read operation, your create operation, your update operation, uh, and whatever operations you want. You're gonna use special annotations on those, and I'll show you an example in a moment. But the whole idea here is whatever you want to support, you write, operate, you write Java methods that implement those things, and whatever parts of the fire spec you're not supporting, you don't write operations for that. The, uh, the server will scan your annotations, will create a server based on that, and it takes care of all the sort of heavy lifting of building a server on top of it. It, does, it deals with parsing and serialization, it builds you a capability statement, uh, it, you know, it handles things like underscore elements, all these fancy features in Fire are all sort of automatically handled. All you need to do is write your actual storage code, so the stuff that goes and talks to your database or whatever your system is. Um, once you're done that, you're going to um, you're going to package all of that up. You're going to create another one more class, this thing called the server class. Uh, the server class extends from a happy fire class called RESTful Server. It ha it's going to have probably just a couple of lines of code where you're sort of declaring all your resource providers and packaging them all together. You're going to bundle that up together into what's called a WAR file in uh, in in Java. And then you're gonna deploy that up to whatever server you're using. Uh, the WAR file, incidentally, it stands for Web Archive. It's just the dumbest name they could have come up with, but it's 15 years old at this point, so whatever. Um, that, that, that thing that you create is the thing that you will deploy into your container. There are plugins for every, you know, if you're using IntelliJ or Eclipse or NetBeans or whatever IDE, there's, there's plugins for all of them that sort of ease the process of creating these WAR files. Uh, so the, the whole process is pretty easy, actually. A uh, simple example of what these resource providers look like, uh, they, they really the only rule is that they have to implement an interface called iResourceProvider. iResourceProvider has one interface, one method on it, and it's the one I'm showing here, and that just declares what resource type your provider is creating. You're gonna create a bunch of these resource providers, one for each resource type you're supporting. So if your server supports the patient and the encounter resource, then you've got two resource providers, one for each, uh, and they're each gonna have this get resource type. And then you're gonna add code that implements all of your various, uh, your various operations. So a couple of examples here. Um, this is what your read method looks like. It's got this at read annotation on it and it takes one parameter, that's the type or the ID of the resource you're providing. You're going to populate a patient resource, you're gonna return it and that's that. 
Um, just like I was saying with the client, you know, these, this is a few examples here, but really what's important is that you go and see the, uh, the Happy Fire website where we've got examples, like we've got detailed examples of every last one of these, uh, these annotations and how they work. So there's lots and lots of samples of, of how these things are all structured. And there we go. So this is, this is a link to the actual, the link in, in the, on the Happy Fire website that shows all of the different, uh, all of the different sort of, you know, how would I do a transaction or how would I do a conditional create? All of that's supported uh, and it's all, there, there's just copious examples on that, uh, that page about that. So I think I'm right on time, which is great. Uh, this is actually the end of this talk. I'm gonna point out three samples where you guys can now start to, uh, to get building. And I think I'll, I'll even try and pop that up on my laptop for a second. The three samples I've got up on, on the page are these. If you're interested in trying out using a client, Check out this link right here. Um, that is a complete sort of, I, I call it a skeleton project. It's a complete sort of Maven build project. It's got all the dependencies you need already pre-installed to use Happy Fire. You can open it up inside IntelliJ, inside Eclipse, whatever, and your IDE will pick, it'll download automatically all the library stuff you need. Um, the example that's there, Brings, it's got a single class inside it that includes a simple example of doing a patient read and then printing the results to the console. The whole thing works, but it's got a whole set of exercises you can try afterwards. So if you wanna try adding a create operation or a search operation or whatever, that's a great place to start. Uh, and in fact, there's a second class in that repository called Hints that gives answers to all of the, uh, all of the sample challenges that are in there. So if you get stuck, you can, uh, you can have a look at the Hints class and you'll see uh, lots of samples there. Uh, the server example is the next one. This server example goes into the, into the plain server, so it shows a simple resource provider. Uh, in, the, in the example that's in there, there's not even a database, it's just hard coding a, a patient resource to return. Uh, and you can customize that. So if you wanted to create your own server, you will have one up and running on your laptop in five minutes tops if you, uh, if you go and check out this example. Uh, I will point out that both of these as well are in this repository called Firestarters that exists on the Firely GitHub. Uh, this, this entire GitHub repo goes well beyond just Happy Fire examples, so I would say bookmark it for sure. Uh, there are examples on there for the .NET framework as well. There's some Swift examples for iOS. There's a JavaScript tutorial in there as well. So there's a bunch of really good stuff. Uh, and I will say, if anyone here has other programming languages they maintain uh, tooling for, we would love other contributions to this repo as well. So do feel absolutely free to file pull requests with, um, you know, with the language of choice you've got. Or if you find problems with the existing examples, that's great too. Uh, I didn't talk almost at all about the JPA server today, uh, which of course is the, the server in a box with its own database schema and all of that. If you'd like to get started on that, uh, this repo right here, the Happy Fire JPA server, starter is intended to be your starting point for the JPA server. Uh, we had a comment earlier this morning that is it okay to bring this thing to production? It's called Starter, and yes, absolutely it is. Um, the intent here is not that this is sort of a throwaway project. It's, it's intended to be just a, uh, a working example of the JPA server that you can build on top of. You can customize to your needs. There are plenty of people out there that have built production solutions using the JPA server, Starter as their, as their launch point. So that is fully its intent. We keep it up to date, so anytime there's new features, we add those immediately to the, uh, to the JPA server, Starter. Uh, do, I, I think it's kind of a fun project to play with. It uses this properties file for configuration. And if you wanna turn on terminology services or subscriptions or, I don't know, you wanna do web sockets or outbound rest calls or you wanna turn on validation or whatever the thing is you wanna play with, uh, all you need to do is set a property inside the properties file on that project and you will have that away to go. The JPA server starter as well, uh, it's got this massive readme in its GitHub repo and that includes within literally less than five minutes you can have that thing up and running. Uh, using an embedded Derby database, which is nice, or it's actually an embedded H2 database these days. So you don't even need to install anything to have a working complete fire server, uh, including if you want terminology and subscriptions and all kinds of crazy stuff uh, using that library. So that's kind of fun stuff. 
Uh, that takes me to the end. I'm going to hang around uh, up here for the next while. So if anyone has any questions about any of this stuff, I was hoping we could spend the last little bit of our time uh, coding together. So this is a great opportunity to, uh, to do that. I'm going to say one other thing before I wrap up. If anyone has noticed on the back of my laptop, I've got stickers for our, uh, our new Happy Fire logo. Uh, if anyone would like a laptop sticker, come and hit me up. I'm gonna, maybe I'll put a few of them on, uh, on the table in front of me. So come and grab a sticker. That's that. Thank you all.